Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. This message I want to share with you uh, today is called the Parable of the Dog. And uh, I actually have just released a book called Parable of the Dog based on this message. It's not here uh, at present. Possibly it's on Amazon.com as well by now. I'm not sure, but we've only just put it out a few weeks ago, so we couldn't ship it out here in time. But in my opinion, it's possibly one of the most important messages that I feel God has given me in today's Christian world. <clears throat> and there's a few of those. I, I think faith is a really important message. Leadership is an important message. And the Holy Spirit, I find a lot of churches are leaving the Holy Spirit out of, out of church, kind of going for produced services rather than powerful service. I think you can have both. And, and, and it's, it's important because the, the one factor that gets left behind as the church travels through time is the power of God, always. And I know ministers, churches, whole movements that used to be firing, used to be top of the pile, used to be proclaiming the prophetic word to the whole world, and, and yet now hardly even know about them. Nobody even hears about them. And so you can have it, but you can lose it. And so that's why tonight I really want to focus on bringing that power of the Holy Spirit and fresh oil into our lives. One of the bases for that happening in our world is, is like how we approach this message that I'm sharing here today, which is essentially about the Lordship of Christ. In Acts 2 verse 36, it says, God has made this Christ both Lord, this Jesus, both Lord and Christ. He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, but that's not all. He's also the ruler, the Lord. You'll find that word in, in the Greek means possessor. He possesses everything, owner. He owns everything. He's the master of everything. He has absolute authority. He is the supreme Lord, the supreme sovereign of the entire universe. Matthew 28 verse 18 says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Everybody say that with me. All power is, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he, and he follows that with a command, go therefore. And part of that command is us recognizing that he has all authority in heaven and earth and nothing's impossible when we go out and, and, and work for him. He has the power to forgive sins. He has the power to do all sorts of things throughout the entire, entire universe. The Bible speaks of him as the king of kings. There's no king that he is not the king of. He's the Lord of all lords. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the only sovereign. He is the Lord of all. He is the Lord both of the dead and the living. In all things, the Bible says, he has preeminence. Jesus Christ has been elevated, exalted, ascended to the highest position in the entire universe, in all of God's world, in all of God's eternity. There is no higher than Jesus Christ. He is Lord. And we sing that, that He is Lord. Now, this is awesome news. It's fantastic because we know that Jesus is on our side and He is the, he's the Lord of the universe. Nothing is beyond His rule. However, having said all that, to tell you the honest truth, it means nothing. It means nothing if he is not my Lord. He can be the Lord of the entire universe, but until he is my Lord, it means nothing to me. And it's only when it gets a context to it that it's my world he is the Lord of, my universe that he's the Lord of that it starts to actually impact my life. Now, when I met Jesus Christ, I was 19 years old. I heard about a Savior. I heard that Jesus could save people, that He could transform lives, like these two guys here, Gary and Elijah. I heard that He was a Savior, and all of that's incredible, but it means nothing until He's my Savior. He actually saves me. And that happens through me sending out an invitation to Him saying, Lord, would you come into my life and would you save me? And that's an awesome moment. And I find that most of Christianity today is actually focused so strongly on that point 
that they find it hard to move beyond it. And so many people are, we, we, we talk about the cross, and so we should. It should occupy an immense amount of our communication. We talk about the blood of Jesus and the grace of God, sometimes to an extreme level, where it's all the grace and the blood and, and the cross of Jesus saving our soul, delivering us and healing us. And we go, thank you, God, that's awesome. But I got to tell you, God wants us to move, not away from, but from that to keep moving into a deeper, higher, more powerful Christianity so that he's not just my Savior, but he becomes my Lord. And there are a lot of us who want him to be our Savior, but keep on living life the way we want to live it. But when he's Lord, he's going to change the way you live your life. And if you accept him and live like he's the Lord of your life, you're going to need a whole lot less saving because you won't get into so much trouble. You won't get demons in your head and sicknesses in your body because you're living in a way, in a pathway that prevents those things from coming into your world and bugging you. There's no point in getting saved on Sunday, going out and living like the devil for the rest of the week and coming back next week just to get saved. Somewhere along the line, we've got to realize that he saved us for a reason. And that was to transform our lives from somebody who keeps on needing to get safe to somebody who brings salvation to a world that's lost in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Now, I, I got this message out of a pretty unusual event. A couple years ago, our dog that we'd had for 12 years called, called Aberdeen was a little Scottish West Highlander. He died. And... We thought, you know what? The kids are gone. We're going to downsize our house. Let's just not have a dog. We've had dogs all our lives with our kids and, and loved having dogs around the house. And so <clears throat> for about six months, we didn't have a dog. We moved into the new house, got settled in. And I said, Chris, you know what? I feel like we should get a dog. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm so glad you said that. I want a dog too, you know. So I said, let's get just the same kind of dog as we had because it's little, doesn't bark a lot, shh, doesn't shed hair like that about this dog. And so she says, okay. So we wrote, found a breeder who has West Highlanders and the little white dog. Does it, they're very, very good looking, cute dogs. And, and so we got it. Now, we had never trained out any of our dogs. We just kind of, <clears throat> they were all reasonable dogs. They didn't need a lot of attention and whatever. But I said, you know, Chris said <clears throat> to me, actually, she said, let's, let's get our dog trained this time. I said, really? Uh, she said, yeah. I said, well, how much is it going to be? She had already rung up. And uh, the way women do it, you know. Uh, and she said, uh, <clears throat> well, it's going to cost 150 bucks. I said, oh, it's going to be the, like, worst 150 bucks we've ever spent. That trainer's just going to come up here and look at the gates and the fences and, you know. I said, all right, I think it's a waste of time, you know, but whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so the trainer comes in the house, <clears throat> and uh, she looks around, did exactly what I said, fences, gates, that's yeah, all good. Okay, so now let's feed them. <clears throat> so Chris goes over to the bench, <clears throat> opens a can of dog food, tips it out, and <clears throat> we've got the dog on a leash, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> I'm holding the dog, and uh, just to look like, you know, we're sort of getting ready for training or something. And the dog's like, arr, 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 And Chris is getting jittery, you know, like putting out the can. Oh, all right, I'm coming, coming, coming. Arr, 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 clawing at her legs. Arr, 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 arr. Like this. Oh, you know, like, like we're going to. And she goes like, this is not good. This is terrible. We said, we know. Uh, yeah, but what do you do? So she said, well, this is what we do. So she put the, <clears throat> the, the plate of dog food on the ground. And the dog goes, donk, 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 towards the dog bowl. And when it's about that far away, the leash, donk, stops it. Annoying, isn't it? You know, but... Like, that was five minutes into it, and, and the dog won't stop. Food just far away. I said to her, how long does this take? 
She says, as long as it takes. I said, what does that mean? She says, I've got an appointment at 3 o'clock this afternoon. It's 11 o'clock. I've got four hours. I thought, no, four hours of this? I shut the doors because it sounded like we were murdering a dog. I think the neighbors are going <laughs> to... So the dog is still there going... 20 minutes later, still going like this. It's starting to shake and tremble, but it can't stop by... Eventually, it starts to slow up. It's losing energy. It's trembling. One ear's gone up. The other one hadn't gone up yet. It's flopping down. I said, so now he can eat, all right? She said, oh, no. We want calm and quiet. Till he's calm and quiet, sitting there. I thought, man, I need you to talk to my children. <laughs> I knew a lot of you are thinking that right now. You think, golly, what's her number? And so finally, the dog is sitting there. He says, that's good. We wait a little bit. Okay, so the dog plate food's there. She lets the leash go, go on him, and he runs for the ball. <laughs> Woofing. She says, Oh, that's not good. Pulls him back. <laughs> like this? Just going crazy. I thought you mean woman. You are so cool. How could you do that? <laughs> Looking at the food, it's like this far away. <laughs> so then he's trembling, standing there, like sits down. I said, now? He said, no, calm and quiet. So then she taps the ball like this which became the sign that he could eat. So he goes over. <laughs> she says, that's better. Yeah. We got our dog trained just like that. She said, if you can train him in this area, get obedience in this area, it's going to spill into all the other areas. Once you dominate his food, you got him under control. Most every other area. It was unbelievable. It's like a miracle in front of our eyes. I'd never seen something like that happen so transforming. But it didn't happen without some training and some pain. Every single one of us are born with disobedient flesh. How many of you had to teach your kids to lie? Hmm? You didn't have to do that. You had to teach them how to tell the truth. How many of you had to teach your children how to be selfish? Mine. That's what you do, kids. You go, mine. Don't, don't share. They'll do that naturally. You got to teach them how to share. You got to teach them how to give all the things that are godly have to be trained into our lives. Doesn't happen at the cross. Happens under lordship. So transformation is when I realize that this flesh body I've got is in league with the devil to destroy my soul. Yes. And I got to get the lordship of Christ over this body. I got to pick up the cross. He doesn't put it on me. I've got to embrace the thing that kills me. And every one of us has got something in our life that kills us. We say, this is killing me. Pick it up. Embrace it. One of the greatest days of your life is when you've when you feel dead to yourself. That dog sits up proud, feeling better about itself. Its self-image is strong. It's an obedient dog. I feel better about the dog when I'm walking down the street and all these other mutts are jumping up on people and everything else. And I say, stay. And he just walks beside me. It's such a good feeling. 
I'm the king of the universe. You know, it's like. And he feels so good. He looks at me. Daniel was walking along the beach with me the other day. And, and, and it was so cute. He's going like, because there's a person over there. And he wants to go over and sniff him or, or say hello. He goes, he looks at me, you know, like, can I go? I said, go. <laughs> it's so wild. Such a good feeling. How does God feel when he says, you're looking at him? He says, yeah, sure, go. And you go. But when we're off doing our own will, I'm not thinking about you. I'm going to do what I want to do. He says, oh, man, you're going to get into trouble down there. Boom, you fall down a cliff. Back to the cross. God, I'm sorry. (laughs) He would like us to get from that to walking tall, being strong, empowered with the Holy Spirit, living under the Lordship of Christ. Listen, don't think that it's difficult just for you. Everybody faces this issue. Even Jesus, the Son of God. And there was no other pathway than the same pathway we have to travel to learn obedience. Obedience is not a gift you get. It's not instinctive to any of us. Hebrews 5.8 says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus was taken through painful things that we don't know about. Painful moments in his life, heartbreaking things. Maybe he had a girlfriend at some stage. And the Lord God in heaven said, that can't can't happen, son. And he had to put it on, so to speak, the cross. He He had to die to his own thing on that one. And you know, this is, the Lordship is saying, what do you think, Lord? It's surrendering our direction, our our future into the hands of God, prepared to actually let it go. I actually do do things a little further than that. I say I'm going to let it go. I let everything go all the time. Everything I got, I let it go. I say, God, I'm not going to do this. And if it comes back, I want you to do it. Then I know I'm being called and I'm following. Rather than me initiating, say, I'm going to do this, God. Can you bless me, please? It's more about blessing coming on what he has guided us to do. So when we actually surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we say, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to pick up my cross. He says, you can't can't follow me unless you pick up that cross. Most of us are laying down our cross and picking up our life. But it's actually laying down our life and picking up our cross is the secret to your happiness, is the secret to to your joy. And though he was a son, he learned obedience through, these, through the things that he suffered. Over in Isaiah 43, verse 1, it says, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Now, in that very first passage there, it says, Jacob, I created you but I formed you Israel. Same guy, same person, different names. But in between being Jacob and Israel, he fought with God. He wrestled with what God wanted to do in his life, just like Jesus did in the garden. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Finally, he surrenders and breaks to the will of God, not what I will, but what you want. And so surrendering takes you from being a Jacob to an Israel. Because in those moments, there is a forming that goes on in your life. Right through the Bible, you'll find men who were awesome awesome figures of history like Abraham. He wasn't always Abraham. He was Abraham at one stage. But between Abraham and Abraham, Abraham, a change took place in his life, a transformation where he went through painful times And he found himself transformed into the person who would fulfill the destiny. Jacob got the vision. Israel fulfilled it. Same man, same purpose, different name, different nature. Abraham got the vision. Abraham fulfilled it. Sarai got the vision. Sarah fulfilled it. Simon Peter, Simon, Simon got the vision. Peter fulfilled it. A man called Saul got the vision. A man called Paul fulfilled it. All the same person. 
God is interested in actually transforming each one of our lives. Right through the Bible, you will find God as mentioned as, a, as the bread of life, as a fountain, as a river. He has all sorts of things. But one of the most graphic pictures of God to me is as an artist. It says that Michelangelo, when he was carving out things like Il David and the great sculptures that he would build, he would bring down the career of marble from the mountains. And it says in, in history books that sometimes he would work for three days without sleeping or eating in his studio. He was so inspired. He said it was like a snowstorm in his studio as he carved out these great angelic figures. And all these beautiful, beautiful creatures came out of this formless stone. People would say to him, how do you, how do you get, a, get such a beautiful looking figure out of such a formless blob of stone. He says, when I look at the stone, I see the angel within. I can see an angel inside that. And all I am doing is taking away all the bits that are obscuring the angel. Every artist is inspired at the beginning with something that's shapeless and formless. I paint a little. One of the most inspiring things in my life is a blank canvas. Thinking, my Lord, possibilities here are endless. What could happen on this canvas? When God looks at your life, He is so excited about what He could do in your world. It says, He who created you, Jacob, and formed you, Israel. We get born again. We get created when we come into this world. You know, uh, one of the most amazing, amazing things for me is to think about self-awareness. It's something the evolutionists have never been able to explain to us, how you know you, you. you I mean, you can't evolve self-awareness. You can't be half aware. I'm only sort of half aware I'm here. Or some people have this idea that we are reincarnations. We were once somebody else, but now that person is here. Hey, this is my life. Nobody else is, get out of my life. This is me. And you're not going to become somebody else. You're not, we're not somebody else somewhere at the time. This is you. This is your life. You get one life. That's it. And God wanted you to have this life. Your life was not meant to have a, have a use-by date on it. It doesn't have a shelf life. Oh, time's up. Boom. Annihilation. You were created for eternity. Forever and ever. And when God initially thought of you, he went, oh, he thought of a Jim Cobray. It made him smile. He sang. The stars danced for joy. Then he thought of Deb Cabray. Boom! The whole orchestra played in heaven. He laughed. God laughed in heaven. He said, oh, my Lord, I want one of those. I'm going to make me one of those. And so now they're here. And you're here. And you can say, I'm here. I'm created. You were not once. You didn't exist once upon a time. You have been created with self-awareness. You know you're here. I mean, donkeys don't know that. Turtles don't know that. But you were not just created to be here. You were created with a divine plan. God said, oh, I could get them to do this and that, and it would be so exciting if we did this together. So he put personality and gifts and equipment on the inside of you. What, you're not here by accident. Gary and Elijah are not here by accident. Divine design has, has put them in this place. God is not the God of oops. He didn't go, whoa, Phil Pringle's here. Whoops, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> what are we going to do with him? Anybody got any ideas around here? They all went silent. They said, oh, nothing could be done with that guy. <laughs> now he, he, there was a timing, there was a perfect moment in the history of the, of the universe where he said, I'm going to... And God didn't just think of one or two, he thought of billions. Like... A thousand, a billion little lights showering out of his mind, thinking, I like that and that and that. God thinks big. He thinks in billions all around the world. Then he thought of all the different colors and all the different creatures. and thought. But then he, he knows that that destiny doesn't automatically happen. It needs to be entered into by the will of every one of those human beings because he gave each of us a free will. He said they can do what they like, like me. Complete freedom. God is completely free. And he says, I'm going to give them the freedom of choice so they can choose it or not. 
They can make me Lord or not. And so once we accept Jesus as Lord, we've got to make him the Lord of our basics if we're to find out our destiny. So he becomes the Lord of the specifics. And the basics in our life are getting a lifestyle that he can actually get his hand on. So he says to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house, check out how I form people. Jacob I've created, Israel I formed. How I, as a potter, as an artist, form lives. Once they're born, once they're created, then I get into forming them, training them. So the first thing is to get on that wheel at the potter's house. Initially, you come in, you're a lump of clay in the corner, formless, shapeless, nothing much going on. He takes that and he puts it on the wheel. And once you lay yourself, get on the wheel, which is going round and round and round and round and round and round and round. You go round and round and round. You go to the potter's house is the church. That's the potter's house. That's, he comes in here, starts shaping our lives. And you go round and round. Go to church on Sunday. Go to connect group in the week. Go to the prayer meeting on Tuesday night. Round and round. When is this ever going to end? Never going to end. Round and round. It's called the potter's house. Round and round. Routine, predictability, reliability, character forming. Round and round and round. You go round and round. That's it. You think, that's all? No. That's the beginning. Got yourself in a place where his hand can come upon you. You're not jumping all over the place. We're going, oh, wow, wow, I'm trying to get this part. You're on the wheel so he can start forming. Squeezes you, you go higher. He pours water all over you. You get slippery. You think you get the Holy Ghost on you to go and do all sorts of things. One of the things you get the Holy Spirit on you is so that he can form you. And so then you're tall and you're sitting on the wheel and the spatula comes on you, picks you up, takes you over. You say, Lord, I thought, I thought that was it. We're done, aren't we? We're, they're, they're, I'm good. We're, I'm a vessel. Look at me. He said, no, we're not finished yet. Yeah? We've we got to dry you out on the shelf here. What, I'm going to sit up here with all these other church people every week and do, do nothing much at all? I'm a preacher to the nations. I'm a, I'm a prophet to the kingdoms. He said, try being just a witness to your suburb. That would help. And uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to just sit around church. I don't want to be a consistent member. That sounds so boring. Sounds so, he said, learn how to do it. Sitting there, hanging out, being part of the crew. And you're sitting there and you finally get a little settled about, oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm here. You can trust me, Pastor. I'm here each week. I'm here to worship. I'm here to get into it. I'm a front-footed worshiper. I'm, I'm a giver. I'm, I'm going to be there on that wheel, tithing, regular. I'm consistent. I'm not unreliable. And all this kind of thing. So you've got that basic lordship lifestyle in your life. Then he, the spatula comes, picks you up. You think, whoa, now we're going. I'm going to go out. I'm going to preach. I'm going to do things for God. I'm going to, and, he, and, he, and, and he's taking you this direction. He said, no, Lord, 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 no, there's the door, Jesus, out there. That's, I don't want to go over there. That's the hot thing, the hot thing. I hear screams coming out of the hot thing. I don't want to go into the hot thing. <laughs> Boom, in you go. Opens the door. Ha! It's only in there that you're going to discover Jesus. When you're in the fire, there's going to be a fourth man walking around in there with you called Jesus. And you'll be closer to him in there than you will any other time. Isaiah says, in the furnace of affliction, I have chosen you. Because it's only under pressure that we discover who we really are. You only know what's in that toothpaste tube when you squeeze it. And when you get the squeeze comes on, who we really are actually emerges. Because we can, while we're cruising around and we're all emotionally together and, and nothing really is stressing us. We can be the most sweet people on earth. But who we really are happens when we're in the fire. And if a crack comes there, God wants to know how we're going to do in the simulator. The simulator is an artificial experience of real reality coming up. And so God will take you through those simulated experiences, which you, you will feel, this is way more attack and trial than my current level of responsibility. Exactly. He's getting you ready for your future. You can't buy now and pay later with God. You pay now and get later. That's how it works with him. So you pay the price and you fight the lion and you fight the bear and that pulls a giant killer out of you. And once you got a giant killer out of you, you meet Goliath and you save a nation. 
And once you kill a giant, that Goliath, you want to be thankful for every Goliath that comes in your life because it pulled a king out of a young man. He rose every time he won a victory. You cannot be an overcomer unless you've got something to overcome. And the way that you become an overcomer is by fighting back in your trial. You're going to get through every, every difficulty you're facing. You're going to get through every challenge you've got in your life. There is a purpose behind your pain. God is forming you for divine destiny, an amazing purpose. You know, the beginning of that journey starts at the cross where you actually say, God, come into my life. But he will not push himself into your world. He comes because you invite him. The devil will push himself into your life, but not God. You got to push the devil out and invite Jesus in. And here today, you can do that. In about one minute's time, I'm going to ask you to say a prayer with me so that God can come into your life. In a couple moments, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you've never prayed that prayer. If you're saying, if you're saying I, I, I haven't prayed that prayer, God, come into my life. I've not made an invitation to Jesus to come into my life. Well, you can do that in about two minutes from now. And so whatever you do, when I say lift up your hand, make sure you lift your hand up. Also, there may be some of you here today, you haven't been at church for a while, but now you're here. And it's time for you to come back. It's time for you to return to the Lord and make sure you're right with God. I want you also to raise your hand when I ask. And there may be some of you who, like, you're, you go to church, but you're not sure if you're going to heaven. You hope you are. You think you are, but you're not certain of it. I want you also to raise your hand when I ask. So right now, across this auditorium, can I ask everybody to close your eyes? And if that's you, if you're saying, Pastor Phil, I have not prayed that prayer, God, come into my life. I've not prayed the prayer that says, Jesus, I want you in my world. Or if you're saying, I'm coming back, I used to follow Christ, I used to pray, I used to go to church, I need to get back. Even if you've done this several times, you need to do it again today and let it stick. Or if you're saying, I'm just not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, I hope I do. If I was to say to you, you're going to heaven, you'd say, well, I, I sure hope I am. I'm a good person. Well, it's good that you're a good person, but that doesn't get you there. Christ is our only entrance into heaven, and he comes into our life because we ask him. And so right now, my friend, if you have never prayed that prayer, if you've never said, God, come into my life, or if you've been away from God, or if you need to make sure you're going to heaven, right now, when I say one, two, three, I want you to raise your hand. You ready? One, two, three. Three, raise your hand high. Thank you, 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 thank you. Yeah, I see your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There are others here. Raise them high. Come on, raise them high. I know that there are other people here who have never made this decision. Please raise them right now. Whatever you do, don't hold back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else is there? Who else is there? Come on, raise it high. Say, Pastor, I got to do this. All right, thank you. I saw your hand. Just go up. Yeah, thank you. I saw your hand. Go up. Thank you. I saw your hand. Just go up. Thank you, young lady. I see your hand. Okay, can I ask everybody to look this way? What I'm going to do now is all those of you who raise your hands, when we stand up, I want you to move straight to the aisle and come down the front. I'm going to shake your hand. I want to pray for you. Even if it was a little child who raised their hand, Mom, I saw a couple of little kids raise their hand. Don't be thinking, oh, they just do that because you say raise your hand. God speaks to little hearts, and it's very important that you bring them down and they can have an encounter with God. Let's all stand. Welcome these people as they come. Please, come right now. Whatever you do, don't stay in your seat. Now is your time. Just step out of your seat. Come now. Yeah, come, 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 come. Now's the time. It's your time. It's your time. Come. Now is your moment. Just come, come, come. Yeah. Come on, who raised their hands? It's so important for you to come. Amen. Good to see you, bud. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, man. God bless you, lady. God bless you. 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 Yeah. God bless you, darling. So good to see you. Hi. 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 Hey. Hey, little guy. How are you? Hi. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Come on. There are others here. Hey, man. Ah, so good you came. 
Come on, there are others here, I know, I know, I know, I know. There's another five people here. It's time to come, it's time to come. Come on, just grab your friend and say, I'm going. I'm getting down there this morning. I'm gonna break through this thing. Whatever's keeping you on your seat, whether it's nervousness or fear, or, or even if you're saying, I don't need that, you know, kind of, I don't need that. Of course you need it. Go on, humor me, give it a shot. Just step out and say, okay, I'll do this. I'm so glad this lady's coming down, amen, with her friend here. Just give them a hand, would you? Come on, there's another, there's another four or five people here. I'm just going to wait another couple seconds. I haven't got any time left. I've gone a little over my time already, and I've I got to hand a meeting back to, my, to our pastor. Hey, there's another person coming, yeah. Anybody else at all? Anybody else at all? Anybody else at all? Now is your time. Right up the back there. Don't think it's a long way to come. It's not a long way to come. Step out of your aisle. Make the journey. If you're in the rooms where you're visiting and you're new to the church with your children in there, we'd more than, more than love to have you. Just take a, take a walk to, to the front here. Bring your child with you. You know, don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. Like these, You're amongst friends. Very good people. Wonderful people. I'm just waiting, I'm waiting, and I'm just talking and waiting for another 10 seconds for anybody else who's going to come, because now's your time. Come on, come on, come on, just step out. Now's your time to make the journey to God. Your encounter is down here with Jesus himself. He's in this house, I'm telling you. I know the Lord. and He's in this place. Thank this lady, yeah, bless her. She comes. Does anybody else? Now is your time. Now is your moment. This gentleman, are you just coming, sir? There's one more person. I need you to come right now. If there's one more, if there's one more, if there's just one more, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. Okay, we're going to pray, but while I'm praying, if you're still coming, Step out of your seat, make your way to the front. Guys, I want you to close your eyes down the front here. I want you to make this prayer your prayer. Can you say these words to God after me? Dear God in heaven, I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. I repent from sin. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me your child. Help me follow you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I renounce the devil. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. Thank you, God, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Lord, let the peace of God touch every heart, every life. In Jesus' name, Lord, we bless you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, everybody up front. Everybody up front. Guys, look up right up here. Look right up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is the best decision of your entire life right now. We're excited for you. Great things are ahead of you. We want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left, waving at you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Wants to give you some free stuff, okay? Some, some information that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next, okay? He'll give that to you free. He'll introduce you to a friend that we have here in the church that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how that works, and then he'll let you come right back out your family and friends will wait for you. If you'll just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as he go. Hallelujah. God is so good. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature 
in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.